Today, price booms, and then what? Property signed for the 28th of July 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's show, we look at the latest CPI data for the June 21 quarter, reflect on New South Wales' booming stamp duty take, visit Westpac's thoughts on future property price movements, also look at soaring construction costs, as well as a recent report that says Australia's heavy reliance on exports of fossil fuels made the nation's economy extremely vulnerable to changes in other markets' emission policies under the current settings. The Consumer Price Index rose 0.8% in the June 21 quarter, according to the latest data from the ABS. The annual pace lifted from 1.1% to 3.8%. That's the fastest pace in 12 years, but this was due to base effects of the negative prints last year, relating to government grants and subsidies that have since expired. As such, this is a transitory blip in inflation, and it won't be of much concern to the RBA. The ABS said that rising fuel prices accounted for much of the increase in the June CPI, with prices surpassing pre-pandemic levels. The most significant price rises in the June quarter were automotive fuels up 6.5% and medical and hospital services up 2.4% due to the annual increase in private health insurance premiums. Electricity prices rose 3.3% and that was due to the continued unwinding of the Western Australian government's $600 electricity credit. Price rises were seen across a range of food items, including vegetables up 5.5%, fruit up 4.7%, and beef up 3.6%, due to a variety of factors, including flooding in the growing regions of New South Wales, a shortage of pickers, and lower supplies of beef as farmers restock. Motor vehicle prices rose 2.2% due to increased demand combined with supply constraints, such as the global semiconductor shortage. The Federal Government's Home Builder and State-based Housing Construction Grants in Western Australia and Tasmania continue to have a significant impact on the new dwelling purchase by owner-occupied series. Prices for new dwellings fell 0.1% in the June 21 quarter. Without the offset from the housing grants, though, the new dwelling series would have risen 1.9%, reflecting demand-driven increases in materials and labour costs. And it's expected that these grants will continue to impact the measurement of new dwelling purchases over the next few quarters as applications are finalised and the grants are paid. While rents for Sydney and Melbourne have fallen when compared to the pre-COVID March 2020 series, rents in most other cities have increased, which reflects record low vacancy rates in those cities. The annual inflation for the June 21 quarter of 3.8% follows a rise of 1.1% in the March quarter, and the annual CPI movement was significantly influenced by COVID-19 related price changes, said the ABS, from this time last year. Key drivers include the full unwinding of the Federal Government's free childcare package, implemented in the June quarter last year, as well as a full return from the drop in fuel prices seen in the same period. These base effects led to a sharp increase in the annual CPI movement. In situations such as this, it's useful to consider underlying inflation measures, such as the trimmed mean, which are designed to remove large one-off price impacts, they said. Trimmed mean inflation rose 1.6% through the year, up from 1.1% in the March 21 quarter. Additional context can also be gained by comparing the current CPI to pre-pandemic levels in the March 2020 quarter. Over the five quarters from the March 2020 quarter to the June 21 quarter, the ABS says inflation rose on that basis just 1.9%. Now, elsewhere, the New South Wales state government collected a record amount of stamp duty in the last financial year, according to new data, but economists warn that Sydney's lockdown could put a dent in one of the state's most lucrative revenue sources. New South Wales residents forked out $7.9 billion in stamp duty on the sale of residential properties in the 2021 financial year, according to data from the New South Wales government, driven by a combination of surging property prices and increasing transaction volumes. A record $930 million in stamp duty was collected in June alone, when more than 21,000 properties changed hands. 
the New South Wales state government collected a further $1.8 billion in revenues on the sale of commercial properties in 2021. Deloitte Access Economics partner Chris Richardson said the remarkable shift in interest rates over the past year has pushed both property prices and stamp duty revenues to record highs. Sydney's home prices surged 15% in the year to June, according to data from CoreLogic, while dwelling prices nationally clocked their highest annual growth rate in 17 years. Transaction volumes have also increased, providing further support to state government budgets. Sydney's residential auction volume surged 81% in the June quarter, while Melbourne's tally jumped 51% as sellers rushed to take advantage of strong buyer demand. BIS Office Economics Chief Economist Sarah Hunter described the combination of higher prices and higher turnover as a double positive for stamp duty revenues, but warned that collections would fall in New South Wales due to the Sydney lockdown. Ms Hunter expects price growth to slow and sales volumes to fall from mid-August as a result of the health orders. Price momentum is also likely to be slow as economic conditions deteriorate in the near term, but Victoria's experience in 2020 suggests that the market should be relatively resilient. The fundamental positive drivers from loose monetary conditions and a shift in preferences towards more space remains very much in place, she said. Lloyds Richardson said the lockdown was obviously a negative for prices, but probably not a terribly large negative, and said that lower interest rates would continue to support price growth. But Ms Hunter said the budget bottom line would hold up in the near term, given the significant time lag between property sale and property exchange when stamp duty is paid. Looking ahead, revenues in July and early August are likely to remain elevated relative to last year, as they will represent the completion of sales contracted prior to the ramping up of restrictions, she said. But Westpac is still bullish on home prices, according to their latest note. They said back in February that they predicted a 20% increase over 21 and 2022. A stronger than expected surge over the first half of 2021 is now expected to see prices up 18% in the first year alone. Lockdowns will see some loss of momentum in the third quarter, particularly in the Sydney market, but an eventual easing in restrictions should see activity rebound swiftly and price growth lift again to the year end. Evidence of an 18% lift in prices nationally, including a 22% gain in Sydney and a 7% increase in housing credit, will set the scene for prudential policy tightening in the first half of 2022, they said. Price growth is expected to slow to 5% in 2022, with most of the increase occurring in the first half. Prices are then expected to decline 5% in 2023, as stretched affordability in most markets combines with the RBA's first rate hike cycle since 2009. The upswing that emerged at the start of this year has continued to run ahead of expectations with markets carrying strong momentum into the second half. Prices nationally rose 12.2% over the first six months, an extraordinary 25.6% pace in analysed terms. Coronavirus disruptions are likely to take some heat out of the markets in coming months. While prices have posted a solid gain in July, momentum already appears to have slowed somewhat with repeated mini-lockdowns across several states and the more prolonged closure in New South Wales starting to impact activity. The number of auctions has halved in Sydney and Melbourne, although it remains well above pre-COVID levels. That reflects both the strength of markets heading into disruptions and degree of adaption to virus restrictions. Price growth may stall altogether, particularly in Sydney, where restrictions look set to last for some time yet. However, any slowing it's very likely to be transitory, with easing restrictions and the national economic rebound driving a subsequent reacceleration. At this stage, they say, that pickup looks likely to be in the December quarter. Rising vaccination rates and the more sustained reopening of the economy will be important catalysts through this period. Moving into 2022, market dynamics and policy changes are expected to become more prominent drivers. Specifically, deteriorating affordability is likely to weigh on unoccupied demand and the tightening in macro prudential policy settings will restrain the supply of credit. So, in line with their previous forecast, they expect affordability constraints to become more binding once the cumulative gain in prices start to near 20%, particularly in markets that had already seen big price increases through the previous cycle, Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart. Deteriorating affordability is already weighing heavily on buyer sentiment. The time to buy a dwelling index in the Melbourne Westpac Institute Consumer Sentiment Survey is down 25% from its peak last November. And there are also tentative signs that finance to owner occupiers has peaked. Notably, new lending to first home buyers is now down 5% from its peak in January. 
Price increases are already impacting affordability and are projected increases, they say, through the remainder of 2021 and the first half of 2022 will see a further squeeze. However, they are not aware of any previous instance in which stretched affordability alone has driven a market correction. Instead, corrections have always been due to either a combination of stretched affordability and policy tightening, for example, interest rate increases or macroprudential tightening, or some shock to the economy. Occasionally, they've been triggered by a combination, for example, during the global financial crisis. And they said, with the economy looking well placed once near-term COVID disruptions ease, policy developments will be key to housing prospects in 2022 and macroprudential policy will be the area to watch. While past macroprudential tightening episodes have targeted investors, there may be a different approach in this cycle. New lending to investors is growing quite rapidly, up 30% over the quarter, but is still at a relatively low level, accounting for around 25% of the total value of new finance approvals, compared to 45% back in 2015. They expect housing credit growth to exceed 7% by the first half of 2022 triggering a likely policy intervention. The precise response, they say, will depend on the composition of lending over the next year. If there is a rise in particular loan types viewed as riskier, for example, high LVR, high debt to income or interest only loans, these may be capped as in 2017. If gains are driven by a more general lift in credit growth, the regulator may instead place a limit on aggregate lenders for investors, as in 2015, and the regulator may also use microprudential guidelines for individual loan assessments, for example, mandating a larger buffer rate to be applied in loan serviceability assessments, differential rates for investors and owner occupiers, or perhaps gearing limits. Reigning in the housing market is clearly not the policy priority right now, they say, particularly given the prospect of COVID disruptions taking some of the heat out of some markets in coming months. However, they expect it to come back onto the agenda quite quickly once the current lockdowns have passed and the economy is picking up again. On balance, while they see an eventual macro tightening as highly likely, the timing is expected to be delayed until around March or June 2022. Measures are expected to be successful and to weigh more heavily on markets where affordability is stretched. Price growth is expected to stall in Sydney and Melbourne through the second half of 2022, but maintain some positive momentum in most other markets where affordability is still attractive. A slowing in the housing market in 2022 is not expected to discourage the RBA from lifting the cash rate in the March quarter of 2023, they said. Those decisions will result from the bank achieving its full employment and inflation objectives through the second half of 2022. The combination of rising rates, stretched affordability and macroprudential policies is likely to see prices easing off their highs by an average of around 5% in 2023, with all markets expected to see modest declines. Their core forecast back in February that dwelling prices nationally will increase by 20% through 21-22 has proven to be overly cautious, and they now see a total gain over the two years of 23%, with 18% coming in 2021. But they've not changed their general view of the dynamics of the housing market over 21-23. to 23. It will be marked by surging prices through the first half of 2022, followed by a flattening in the second half in response to macroprudential tightening, with prices entering a mild correction in 2023 as the RBA begins its rate hike cycle. Several factors, though, limit the risk of a harder landing in the market, they say. Firstly, they don't expect regulators to take a heavy-handed approach to macroprudential tightening. Second, unlike in 2017 to 19, we don't expect to see additional damage from other developments, fears about potential changes to housing-related tax policy and the Banking Royal Commission, both exacerbated the market corrections in 2018 and 19, they said. And finally, we expect that the rate hike cycle will be quite benign, with a peak cash rate of 1.25% being reached in the second half of 2024. And they estimate that anything above 1.25% would push the household debt servicing ratio to levels that see significant stress on household finances. With inflation likely to remain well contained, it will not be necessary to over-tighten financial conditions. 
And elsewhere, the AFR also reported that building costs across all major Australian markets are growing faster than inflation, a trend that looks set to continue for years due to construction demand outstripping supply for both labour and materials. Disruptions caused by COVID-19 are largely to blame, with global supply chain issues negatively impacting both material delivery and pricing, while state and international border closures have led to intractable labour shortages. These are among the findings of the 12th International Construction Market Survey from Turner and Townsend, which reveals that government money and low interest rates are fueling a global construction boom. Of the 19 markets surveyed, just six were deemed cold based on current construction tendering conditions, compared with 53 that are either warm, hot or overheating. The rest are lukewarm. All Australian state capitals are warm, with a positive outlook over the next few years, notwithstanding the ever-looming uncertainty of COVID-19. Matt Billingham, Australia real estate agent lead for Turner and Townsend, said it's difficult to calculate the longer-term impact of the current two-week Sydney construction lockdown, which ends on July the 31st. It remains to be seen how clients and contractors react to that, whether it leads to a significant amount of claims either way for delays, Mr Billingham said. With regard to prices going forward, our view is that contractors are going to increasingly pricing in scheduled risk. COVID-19 shutdowns aside, the report predicts the Sydney, Perth and Brisbane markets will experience annual construction cost hikes of more than 3% up to the end of 2023, while modest yearly increases of 2.5% are expected in Melbourne and Adelaide. And Sydney remains the most expensive place to build in Australia, even though it slipped from position 13 to 45 in the rankings, a reflection on rapidly rising costs elsewhere. The average cost to build in Sydney is $2,640 per square metre, less than half the rate of Tokyo, the most costly city in which to undertake construction, at $5,465 per square metre, followed by Hong Kong at $5,317 per square metre and San Francisco at $5,080. Melbourne building costs at $2,576 per square metre, followed by Brisbane at $2,448 per square metre, Perth at $2,142 and Adelaide $2,070. Mr Billingham said demand for both labour and materials is outstripping supply. There's an infrastructure boom going on across Australia with a huge amount of investment in road and rail, he said. We're seeing a lot of government stimulus and investment in education, health and social infrastructure. And he said private sector development had been patchy to date, but it expects it to accelerate, spurred on by low interest rates. There's a worsening situation with labour shortages across all our key markets, Mr Billingham said. Ordinarily, when the borders are open, our pressure relief valve is immigration, but that's not an option right now. That's having an impact on labour costs, which are going up. It also creates problems for contracting organisations and their ability to deliver projects on time. The other big issue is building material costs, according to Turner and Townsend data. In Sydney over the past 12 months, the cost of steel has risen 10%, rebar is up 20%, while timber prices have soared 25%. And we're anticipating further price increases with global supply chain issues experience expected to continue through 2022, he said. And finally, according to a report in Investor Daily, a new report from a global consulting giant commissioned by powerful super investors indicate that the cost to Australia's economy and financial markets of not lowering carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 will outweigh the cost of investing in emission-reducing activities now. The report from EY, titled Empowering Communities, How Investors Will Support an Equitable Transition to Net Zero, revealed that Australia's heavy reliance on exports of fossil fuels made the nation's economy extremely vulnerable to changes in other markets' emission policies under the current settings. Australia's top three importers of coal and gas have already announced net zero emission commitments, accounting for 71% of total fossil fuel exports, the report said. This leaves the future of the Australian economy and communities heavily exposed to economic activity in other markets, climate policies, geopolitical issues and other factors in those nations forcing Australia to identify products that align to key trading partners' visions or find new trading partners. Analyzing this market from the demand side, global capital markets appear to be shifting away from fossil fuels, which will increase the financing costs and decrease the liquidity for Australian-based operations. The report commissioned by super funds, including Aware Super and Hester, are part of the investor group on climate change, indicated that a change in government policy to aim for emissions reductions of between 40 and 60% by 
of 2010 levels was required in order to minimise the risks associated with the disorderly transition to net zero emissions, including the significant potential impacts to the financial system and communities. Clear policy signals will enable the private sector and communities to identify key opportunities in a decarbonised economy, the report said. And those include encouraging investments in carbon dioxide removal technologies such as carbon capture and sequestration that would ensure a smooth transition to a zero emissions economy. An immediate and steady emissions reduction trajectory would reach net zero emissions by early 2050, resulting in less abrupt transitional impacts on communities, the report said. A delayed trajectory would result in greater transition risk impacts because of more rapid and haphazard decarbonisation, creating more severe disruptions in global economies, particularly on carbon emission intensive industry sectors. Key roles identified in the report for institutional investors in bringing down a just transition to net zero include mobilising capital, investments to communities in transition from fossil fuels, focusing on investments that deliver environmental and social returns and engaging with affected companies to deliver a transition plan. We know the transition is underway. It's foreseeable. It should therefore be manageable, said Rebecca Mikula wright Chief Executive of the Investor Group on Climate Change. Investors and governments have an opportunity to act today to prioritise a just and orderly transition if we want Australia to emerge a winner in the global race to net zero. So standing back, just a quick observation, CPI is nowhere near the headline. It's all transitory for now, despite the fact, of course, the CPI is mismeasured, as I've discussed on many shows previously. And secondly, of course, everyone's talking about housing prices for now, despite the fact that nobody quite knows how long the COVID lockdown in Sydney is going to go on for. And thirdly, the truth is that we have stresses under the waterline both with regard to household finances, as seen in my surveys, and also on the construction and pricing side. And those things, I think, will have a significant impact going forward because prices will continue to rise. And I have my doubts that CPI is as under control as indicated by the ABS and RBA and mainstream economists. We'll see. The bottom line is this. We know that the true costs rising for most households is a lot stronger than in the official statistics. I see that in my surveys. And then more broadly, of course, the question is all this short term pain and hiatus that we're dealing with. We mustn't lose sight of the zero emissions question, because as that final report showed internationally, the tide has already started to turn quite strongly and we are being left behind. And economically speaking, that's a big deal down the track. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.